Okay, hello. So it seems to work now with this conversion of the file. So apparently, uh, maybe I just logged on to earlier or something. Ah, hi, Silvia. Uh, Alex, now I'm organized. Yes, hello. Hello. So, hello. did you manage? Uh, yeah, now it seems to work. I mean, apparently there is still some preparing process with the, with the PDF file, but the PPT seems ready now. We could my, maybe try this. Um, and I have an echo here, so I'm hearing my voice from somewhere else. Uh, you are what? Ah, Steve is here. Hi, Steve. Sorry? What did you say? Um, I have an echo here. Uh, so I'm hearing it twice. Okay, let me... Let me uh, okay. Okay, now... No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it seems fine for me, at least. Oh, hi, Alex. We are here. We are here. So, Sylvia, are you, are you here? Yes, yes. Yeah. So you, you, you are in the Durham node? Yes, Durham node. Okay. So Sylvia will be the chair of the session. So there is some echo, I don't know why. So uh, I will switch, switch off on our microphone right now. So uh, please, Alex, when I when I uh, tell you so by the chat, uh, start speaking to check if there is still echo because I will switch on mm -hmm. okay. the audio. Okay. Okay, no worries. So I've I've been able now to open the presentation. I guess I should go to probably full screen. Let me see what happens. No, then I don't see anything anymore. Okay, can everybody see the first slide now? Does it work? Okay. This is this is here. Okay, so um, it seems that I should start. Um, so uh, we were more or less on time. We had also some slight technical delay here in Southampton, so apparently. Um, Alex, I, don't, I, didn't yeah? mean, I didn't mean that you start, uh, Sylvia. Ah, okay, you okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's just <laughs> that you speak to check the echo. There are two. Okay, hello, here I am. The same team has a Okay. Okay. Can can one see the slide? Yes. Okay. Okay. That that seems to work out. You cannot see the slides. You cannot. Okay. Wow. There is no slides here. I mean, we can see you, but not the slides. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. If Sylvia, I don't know if the rest. I don't know if the rest yeah. can see the slides. We just see something blank. I mean, white. Yeah, you're you're halfway there then. Um, so my my colleagues in Southampton apparently can see the slides. 
No, 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 no. This is Belen in CERN. This is the CERN connection. Hi. Belen, I think we all see the slide. So are you sure you have the right setup on? It always worked. It, always, it has always worked up to now. Please, can you bring another computer? Because uh, yeah, people, okay, so you just go ahead and we will check from another computer. But it has worked in all previous journal clubs. So if it is I the only one, uh, please go ahead. We will yeah. connect to another. Okay. Okay. Uh, so apparently, the other thing seems to have no problem. Okay. So okay. 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 Is it okay? Yes. Yes. It is okay. Okay. So then I think we can start. Alex, uh, you give uh, your presentation. If there are questions uh, in between, we try to keep an eye on that and we'll uh, ask you to stop and we'll take questions. Okay, please. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Silvia. Okay, so um, apparently I cannot hear an echo again, so it seems to be fine, so hello. Uh, welcome to uh, this Invisible Strong Club, um, and special welcome to the groups in uh, Heidelberg and also in Barcelona. And yeah, so my name is Alex, I'm from Southampton, and I will give um, again a talk about KEV dark matter, and in this case in particular about uh, uh, model building aspects. All right, so it seems that I can switch the slides. So this is my, my outline. So we'll give you a short introduction and um, uh, to the talk itself and also to, to uh, KEV dark matter. I will be a bit brief there because in principle we have already heard from Carlos Frank most of what I could say here. Um, but then um, the focus will actually be really on uh, the model building aspects. So um, I'm going to talk about that and also on some example models. And then, uh, depending on how I am with time, I will also shortly mention the generalization of uh, KV stereo neutrinos, and then it should be time to conclude. <coughs> All right. So, um, like every talk in physics, I uh, start with some with some problems, and the problem that we have in neutrino physics is that neutrinos mix. Um, this we know very well. Um, we have uh, by now measured all mixing angles, in particular this year we have measured theta one three, which was which turned out to be surprisingly large, actually. Um, but we have essentially no clue where these values come from. So this is one of the puzzles that we have in neutrino physics. And um, another puzzle, which is, which is equally non-trivial for us to understand, is um, that neutrinos do have tiny masses. So we actually have a couple of experiments that really hint to a mass scale even below the electron volt, below one electron volt. Um, but also there we have essentially no clue why the neutrino mass is so small. So we, we definitely need an explanation for that. Um, equally bad in the dark matter sector, we know the dark matter is there. We have measured it. We have, uh, we have measured the, the CMB. Um, we have seen several other evidences for dark matter. But also there we have just no clue whatsoever what, what that could be. And so this definitely desires an explanation. Um, so we have to think about solutions here. And we actually have a couple of those solutions um, for all three problems. Um, for example, like of course for for uh, neutrino uh, for leptonic mixings, we have flavor symmetries which are relatively successful in explaining patterns. Um, we have, in particular, for neutrino mass, the CISO mechanism. We have several dark matter candidates, so it's really like this that there are plenty of ideas around. It's just we don't know which one is the right one at the moment. And um, of course, the most ambitious goal that we could have is to um, tackle all these three uh, questions at once. And it's not really clear if this is going to work. Um, but of course, um, if it works, it would be very nice. Um, however, it might be that it's, that it's really difficult. So we, we might have to, to pay a price for that, like um, always in model building. OK, so um, shortly about um, KEV and or warm dark matter. So one, po one point I really want to stress here is that um, usually people say that KEV is equal to warm. That is just not very true. Um, rather, it really depends on the actual production mechanism of the dark matter. But apparently, it is indeed true that in many settings, KeV mass particles turn out to be kind of warm dark matter. Still, one has to be careful. And uh, so in astrophysics, um, people are debating about the properties of dark matter. And in particular, in the structure formation community, there is quite some debate um, if uh, dark matter is, is warm or if it's cold. Um, so historically, we had essentially all these possibilities here, hot or warm or cold. And um, the, the most appealing possibility a couple of years ago was apparently hot dark matter in the sense that we um, 
or, or well, not really hot dark matter. What, what the, the only candidate in the in the standard model that we have is in principle light neutrino, and that is actually quite a perfect hot dark matter candidate. And that was quite appealing because we we uh, knew that the standard model was there to some extent, and um, neutrinos could have made the dark matter. Um, this is ruled out now, so we're very clear by structural formation that this cannot be the case, and we're left with the other two possibilities. And now my slide is stuck. Okay, so let's see. Here we go. Um, okay, so we are uh, left with two other possibilities, namely warm and cold dark matter. And um, so uh, this is what we what we have heard by by Carlos Frank, and that was of course a um, uh, great talk, and we have been given a lot of information there. So um, I will be brief here. Just one thing that I want to mention is I mentioned here this uh, so-called dwarf problem, the uh, dwarf satellite galaxy problem. And um, as we have heard from, from Carlos Frank, this is actually not, it's not 100% clear if this actually is a problem in itself. Um, still, it's probably, it's probably in dwarf uh, galaxies where we, can, where we can in the end have some uh, clue about um, if we have warmer cold type matter. All right. Um, so we know that this possibility is excluded. We know that these two are still in the game. And this is about all I want to say about this, because uh, simply because this is quite, uh, there is definitely quite some debate uh, among astrophysicists. And I don't want to enter the debate, because I'm here to talk about particle physics. Um, all right. So um, still, we have some observational hints for a KEV-type dark matter. Of course, the question is if we, if we should take these hints serious or not. Um, there is, of course, room for interpretation. So we, we have, in principle, this um, issue with the dwarf satellite galaxies. But we have heard from Carlos that there could be some astrophysics solutions to, a solution to that. Um, we have some model-independent surveys, like the Alfalfa survey, which seem to point at the KV scale. But of course, it's um, always a question like in how far this is really a hint, or in how far you take that as observation or not. And um, we also have some, some model-independent analysis um, that point towards the KV scale. However, we have to be careful again because some of them have been done by people who are apparently uh, warm dark matter fans, which does not mean that it could be in any way uh, biased. But of course, um, one should always like have as many independent tests as possible. All right, um, one simple framework that, uh, from a particle physics point of view, that can accommodate for warm dark matter is the so-called new MSM, the neutrino minimal standard model by um, Asaka Bloshi and Shaposhnikov. And um, this is essentially a framework that has been um, that has been investigated for quite some time from cosmology and from the astrophysics side in the recent years. And um, this is uh, apparently very simple because we don't really extend the standard model by much. In fact, we, we extend the standard model just by three right-handed neutrinos. And um, what that already gives us is that we can accommodate for neutrino oscillations, for the barren asymmetry of the universe, and for warm dark matter. However, um, we really have to extend the standard model by very peculiar right-hand neutrinos. Namely, we need a very specific mass pattern. In particular, we need the lightest right-hand neutrino, or sterile neutrino then, as mass I can state, um, to be in the, at the KV scale. And we need the other two in order for the barren asymmetry. We need them to be roughly at the GEV scale. And in particular, they, their masses have to be very degenerate. So this is what's indicated by this epsilon here on the slide. And um, however, once we assume that this mass pattern is there, of course, we have a model which provides a very fundamental connection, actually, between two um, sectors in particle physics, which um, are clearly signs for beyond the standard model physics, namely neutrinos, which are massless in the standard model, and uh, between dark matter. Um, so there is something funny going on in my office here. Doesn't matter. Um, OK. so. Uh, in particular, this is a very minimalistic extension of the standard model because we really do not add much. We actually just add uh, three single neutrinos and we add um, lepton number violation by a Majorana mass term. Um, but in fact, this is not everything because, um, as I just said before, we have not explained several things. So we, in particular, have not explained the appearance of this KUV scale in the first place. Um, in principle, it's really a pure assumption. So um, the authors assume that this uh, Majorana mass could be anywhere and um, then it's assumed to be, to be, the mass pattern is just assumed to be suitable. And um, also, we have no explanation for this degeneracy of the, of the two heavy neutrinos or of any neutrino um, oscillation pattern that is more specific than just um, the qualitative statement of having oscillations. And above all, um, all these things together make the new MSM relatively difficult to test 
Of course, you could say that, well, there are, the absence of certain predictions is kind of an indirect test, but of course, this is just an indication in a solid test. So um, it would be desirable from, from a particle physics, and in particular from a model building point of view, to work on all those four issues here that we can see. All right, um, so let's see. Um, what do we need from the model building side? So in principle, um, uh, the minimum goal should really be that we first of all explain um, the setting of the the, the setting with um, uh, with which I'm referring to the mass pattern in the new MSM, and we should also make it testable. And how do we make the testable? Um, for example, if we link this mass pattern to the uh, mass and mixing patterns that we have in the light neutrino sector, and this we can test, and um, then depending on uh, the outcome of our future experiments. Um, we will be able to exclude or maybe also rule in certain models. And um, this really gives us more, more uh, testability than the new MSM has by itself. So the methods that we use are, in principle, um, the methods that are known, because uh, model building is uh, quite some industry by now, and uh, people really know how to do that, know how to deal with symmetries, with mass suppression mechanisms, and so on. Um, so in principle, all the ingredients, all the tools are there. We just have to use them in the right way. And um, of course, the, the benefit of it is that then in the end we have, um, ideally, we have a very interesting link uh, between particle physics properties and um, so between the properties of light neutrinos and uh, between the dark matter in the universe, which um, can be considered to be a very fundamental link. So of course, um, this is the model building for KV neutrinos is a bit different from ordinary model building in the sense that some in some ingredients that we need and also some requirements that we need to meet are different. And um, so, <clears throat> first of all, the, the very apparent thing is we need an explanation for this KV scale. Uh, we have, at the moment, practically no clue where such a scale should come from. So in a standard model, there is not a K, no KV scale in the sense that none of the, of the known standard model particles has a KV mass. And uh, in particular, we have no hints for this scale to be in any way fundamental so related to some really deep principle. So um, what this means is that we really need some mechanism in order to explain the scale. <clears throat> now, um, what we can do usually in a quantum field theory is unfortunately not predict an absolute scale. So this means that it will be really, really hard or practically impossible to sit down, do a calculation, and in the end something like K we pops out. Um, however, what we can do is we can explain patterns. and um, in particular, we can um, explain mass hierarchies. And there are some possibilities around in the literature. And when you look at KV sterile neutrino models uh, with an explanation for the mass scale, then um, what's typically there is uh, one of those two schemes. So um, this bottom up or top down just has nothing to do with uh, any fundamentality or coming from, from a deeper theory or something. It just means that um, we have two schemes how to shift masses. So either we <clears throat> start with a mass that is zero for some reason, and then we, um, we present a mechanism that would shift this mass to a higher value, which is still below the other masses in the game. And then we can say that, well, that this small mass eigenvalue can be at the KV scale, because we have an argument why it should be lower than this. <clears throat> and the other possibility, um, which I like to call top-down scheme, is uh, when it's just the other way around, when our fundamental scale is uh, considerably higher than KeV. Um, but for some reason, um, one of those mass eigenvalues is suppressed so that it's not at its natural scale, but rather at a considerably smaller scale, which we again set to TeV, uh, sorry, KeV. Um, and of course, there are examples for, for both uh, these uh, schemes in the literature. And um, I think I will today have time to talk about both and to talk about some more as well. OK, so uh, most models I've come across fall either into the first or into the second category. Of course, this doesn't mean that this is so universal that uh, nothing else could be there. But many of them are one or the other, actually. Okay. So um, another difference to ordinary model building is um, we have a very hard bound that we have to take into account. And um, this is that if we have a sterile neutrino, which is essentially a right neutrino, N1, which is supposed to be the dark matter, um, then this sterile neutrino will typically, in most of the models, mix with the active neutrinos, because we have active sterile mixing in general, unless we forbid that by some symmetry or by some other mechanism. Um, now, if um, this active sterile mixing is not forbidden, 
what is going to happen is that uh, this dark matter particle that we have is not a stable dark matter particle, but rather it's going to be decaying dark matter. And it can decay via a diagram that looks uh, like a mu to e gamma transition. And while such a diagram, it, um, can, uh, it can decay into a light neutrino and into a photon. And of course, since both these final state particles are practically massless, this uh, decay is going to produce a monoenergetic, practically monoenergetic X-ray line, which is of course broadened by, um, by astrophysics or by the cosmological expansion. Um, but still, essentially, we're searching for an X-ray line. And um, still, this decay is not dangerous for the dark matter aspect itself, simply because if you, if you know how a mu to gamma diagram looks like, this essentially goes with the initial state mass to the fifth power. So if the N1 is at the KEV scale, then um, we're not going to have problems that all the uh, dark matter is going to decay away. So this is going to be fine from that point of view. Still, the issue is we do not see this X-ray line. And of course, by not seeing this X-ray line, we can place a bound. And um, so the bound that can be placed um, is can be um, written like this. This is actually an, uh, a relatively old version. I mean, it's only three years, but it's um, comparatively old. We have some new data, so the actual bound now is a bit stronger. But still, you see that essentially there is this resemblance of the fifth power of the mass. And already with this relatively old figures, uh, we can see that the active sterile mixing has to be considerably suppressed. And um, when we go to um, even newer data, then you really see that like even for relatively low masses, we have um, really a mixing suppression of uh, mixing angle squared of like something like 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8. So this bound is really, really strong. And uh, unless we forbid active sterile mixing, which might have some other problems, um, unless we do that, uh, we will always have to respect this bound. So um, this is really some hard condition for these types of models to survive. And if they don't manage to um, account for that bound, then of course the model is dead from the very beginning. Um, so, all right, then uh, one, one, uh, one remark that uh, I hear very often when I talk about KV neutrinos, and of course uh, people uh, who work on, on models and on neutrino physics typically have the CISO mechanism in mind. And, um, now, of course, you could argue, I mean, in the, in the, in the generic seesaw, this is the diagram that we have, and we go to some low energy theory, theory we integrate out the heavy neutrino, and uh, then we have, so to say, a suppression mechanism for this Dirac mass scale to yield a light neutrino mass, which is, which is relatively small. Now, of course, you could wonder, well, um, now we're talking about right and neutrino masses of KeV, and that's actually pretty small, and in particular, this is uh, relatively small compared to the natural Dirac mass. And of course, one could one could um, ask if then at all the CISO still can work, or, or maybe maybe it cannot. And um, the answer to this is well, first of all, we we really have a very strong suppression of the active sterile mixing already by this X-ray bound that I presented before. And um, when you look at the at the CISO mechanism for KV neutrinos, then first of all, um, depending on which model you're looking at, there are definitely some models, in particular the ones based on split CISO and the Nielsen mechanisms. And in those models, you can you can just really analytically prove that the suppression um, that the suppression of the right handed scale is never going to be a problem. So in these models, you can really show that uh, the CISO mechanism is guaranteed to work. So in such a framework, you can um, without any doubt use it, no problem. And actually, one can show even more, namely that um, okay, now I have a technical problem. So my slide does not seem to switch. Switch it's switched on your screen here? OK, fine. So uh, I, I think I know what I'm going to talk about. So it's fine. So let's hope that, that this is going to switch for me as well at some point. Um, so the point is that um, you can show that whenever, um, OK, now mine is stuck, it seems. OK, yeah, OK, I, I, just, I just go on. Um, so uh, you, can, you can show that whenever a model respects this x-ray bound, then um, we're actually fine um, because this X-ray bound is always so strong that we can actually show that uh, once this bound is there, um, neutrino uh, the, the CISO mechanism is not a problem at all. Okay, so now I try to retrieve my slides. Okay, so this is fine. Um, okay, my presentation has completely stopped. <laughs> so where are you? Are you slide? Okay. Slides are changing on uh, on the webinar. 
Sorry, it works for you? For us, it works. If you have another version... Yeah, I have. I just have to, to switch slides um, at the <laughs> simultaneously on both, but I'm going to try to do that. No worries. Okay, so I'm uh, at the slide now, starting with production mechanisms for KV neutrinos. Let me see. Is this the one where you are? Okay, great. Yeah, things work perfectly. Um, okay. Okay, yeah, this, yeah, they hanged on. This is the precedent screen. This can drain. So, okay, cheers. <laughs> okay, so we're, um, yeah, so now it's, okay, now it seems to be back again here. All right, okay, now, now it works, fine. Sorry, technical problems, that can happen. All right, so um, back to the talk. So uh, we can have uh, several production mechanisms for KV neutrinos. This is, of course, always, um, a uh, problem that we have to solve whenever we propose a dark matter candidate, then uh, we should be able to produce it in the first place because if we don't produce it, it's not going to be there. Um, and the issue with KV neutrinos is that, at least in, uh, in the generic, so the generic, generic um, production mechanism of uh, thermal production does not really work. First of all, uh, KV neutrinos are uh, sterile, so they're not really going to participate in too many interactions. Um, and even if we go into a gauge extension of the of the standard model, where uh, the, for example, in the left-right symmetry, where the sterile neutrinos are at least charged under the SU2 right or something, then still what generically happens is that we that we overclose the universe. So um, there are some production mechanism uh, pro production mechanisms around that work. It's just that really we have to slightly depart from the standard picture, but this is not necessarily a problem. I mean, this is really something that, that can be done and we have we have means to produce KV dark matter. That's not the problem. Okay, so um, fine. Now I'm gonna come to um, the actual the actual talk about example models that are allowed around the literature. And um, there are actually not so many models around. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, the four kind of like main directions that there are. Um, and I will also mention, briefly mention uh, a few more that there are. But uh, this really means that uh, there is still a lot to do. So um, I will, uh, so the, the four that I have selected are mostly selected because of simplicity. Okay, and now my slide is stuck again. Now it's there, okay. So this is uh, mostly selected for simplicity, um, simply because I want to present some more and uh, we have a limited time now. And uh, what is interesting is that actually some of those models are uh, relatively young. Nevertheless, of course, they went into trouble with new measurements of theta 1, 3 this year. Um, and this in particular means that uh, some of the original uh, proposals are now dead or under, under quite some pressure. And it also means that there is still a lot to do because we can see if we can maybe improve these models or maybe find new ones that are okay with everything and still lead testability in the next generation of experiments. Okay, so uh, let's start with the with the first um, category of models, and I start with that one because this, this is probably the most intuitive thing um, that you can actually have, and these are the models which are based on uh, Le minus L mu minus L tau symmetry, and this symmetry is um, has been very well known in model building. So the first proposal I have seen was in 1982, so it's um, older than some of the people listening, and. Um, also later on, it has been applied to the case of uh, KEV sterile neutrinos. And um, what the general features are, this I will tell you already now, so general features are is that, um, first of all, if we apply the symmetry, we relatively generically um, predict a mass pattern, uh, which is 0 mm for light neutrinos and 0 um, capital M, capital M for heavy neutrinos. So this means that in the symmetry limit, we already have um, a pattern which is similar to the one that we want from um, for the new MSM. In particular, we have one massless state and we have two which are exactly degenerate. But of course, this is a bit of a problem because we don't really want a massless right in neutrino, but rather we want it to have a small mass, small mass compared to the other two. Um, and also, we don't really want um, the exactly degenerate light neutrinos, but rather we want to have something that's compatible with the, uh, with the delta M squares that we measure. So uh, what we have to do, uh, like um, always when you, when you apply a flavor symmetry, is that you have to break it again at some point. And what this breaking is going to achieve is that indeed we will have small masses for these zero mass eigenvalues, and also we will lift the degeneracies between the heavier guys. All right. 
So um, this is the, the typical charge assignment um, for this Le minus or mu minus L tau symmetry, which is typically taken to be a global U1 symmetry. Um, however, of course, you could you could doubt a global U1 simply because if a global uh, continuous symmetry is broken, we will have presumably some problems with Goldstone bosons. But it doesn't really matter in that case because you could also take a Z4 symmetry instead and have a discrete symmetry. So this is not too much of an issue here. Um, both of them are going to have the same assignment here. And um, so what you can see here is that indeed always like when we write on such a model, what we do is that we that we take, for example, here the lepton doublets and we assign certain charges under this new symmetry. We do the same thing with the right handed charged leptons, charged leptons and also with the right handed neutrinos. And um, in the general setting, we will, of course, always have a Higgs and we might also have a triplet Higgs, uh, which we have included here for completeness, but this does not necessarily have to be there. Um, now, what is going to happen is that um, when you when you apply the symmetry, um, then what, what you essentially have to do is when you write on the Lagrangian, you're only allowed to write on terms which are allowed by the symmetry. And this means uh, when we write on a Mars term like this with like this big um, spinner of uh, different fields, um, what is going to happen is that some of those entries in this mass matrix here are forbidden by the symmetry because they would violate the symmetry. So if we look at the mass matrix, how it looks like, it will look like this. So there is a certain structure in here and the structure essentially means that uh, we have certain entries which are zero and this will then in the end of course affect the mass eigenvalues and this will also affect the mixing pattern that we predict with the symmetry. And um, so what is going to happen here, we can actually show analytically, that's not so, not so difficult, um, when we apply in addition to this Le minus, uh, mu minus tau, also this auxiliary mu tau symmetry, what is going to happen indeed, as, as um, we just said before, we will have a light neutrino uh, mass pattern with uh, two non-zero eigenvalues and these are um, exactly the same up to a sign, but the sign doesn't really matter because it's just a phase and this doesn't really matter for the physical mass, so these two guys will be exactly degenerate and we have also one light neutrino which is massless. And we have uh, in principle the same pattern for the, for the heavy sector, so also here we will have um, two eigenvalues which are exactly the same apart from a sign and also we will have one zero mass eigenvalue. So we are already at a pattern that looks quite kind of similar to what we need actually in this new MSM. So um, this is kind of okay already. Of course, still from a phenomenology point of view, we're still not really satisfied because we don't really want uh, two light neutrinos to be exactly degenerate. That's just not what we measure. And also it's fine that this neutrino is much, much lighter than those two. Still, uh, we don't want it to be strictly massless, but we rather would like to have a KV scale for that. So um, how we do that is, as I already um, indicated, by breaking the symmetry. And now what um, <clears throat> we did in the, in the paper that, that we did on the symmetry was to say that, well, so the point is actually not so much how you exactly break the symmetry because uh, people working on flavor models know that um, when I want to achieve a particular breaking pattern, I can achieve that. It's just a question of how many gymnastics I have to do for that. Um, the point is, however it will be broken, um, the, the net effect of this breaking, so to say, will, will be always very similar. Um, which is why we said, okay, it's actually worse to point out what happens if you break the symmetry and not so much um, about the details, how you break it. And what is going to happen is that, uh, and this is, yeah, so this is essentially why we use this, this uh, soft breaking just to show the effect that the breaking could in principle have, which is kind of the pragmatic approach. And um, what is, what is uh, going to happen is that we, for example, assume to certain breaking terms. And one example that we had was that we have few breaking terms under the diagonal matrix. So all these, all these terms, when you think back about the matrix that I showed you just a minute ago, um, all these terms were exactly zero. Um, but now we assume that these terms are non-zero. However, um, we are still close to the symmetry limit. So this is really just, a, so all these are just really breaking terms. So we, um, we have the non-zero, but the entries are small. Um, once we have that, we modify the eigenvalue pattern and uh, we modify it in a quite interesting way. And the way how we modify it, first of all, we have an argument um, why these terms are small. Of course, one could say that this is kind of artificial, but it's in principle, it's similar like the, the proton-neutron isospin symmetry in nuclear physics. So um, in principle, we are just close to a symmetry limit and assume that nature is essentially this symmetry plus a small breaking. Um, 
and uh, this is essentially what we applied. And what is going to happen is that, first of all, the sum the S was this um, right-handed neutrino mass eigenvalue that was exactly zero before. So this is not going to be exactly zero now anymore. Rather, it's going to be of the order of, this, of these breaking terms. And um, this is now the thing that we will later on set artificially to KeV. Why artificially? Simply because we do not, we are, we are not able to explain absolute scales since we're using quantum field theory. That doesn't work. But we are able to explain that this here is uh, much, much smaller than this new R, than this natural scale. And by this we have achieved a certain pattern. We have achieved a pattern that this here could be at KEV and also that we have, uh, sorry, that we have here two eigenvalues of the, of the heavier right hand neutrinos which are not exactly the same anymore, but they're apart by a small quantity and this small quantity happens to be the same as the KV neutrino mass. So we really have achieved a pattern that looks practically like the, the new MSM. Um, but this is not the only thing that we can do. But, and that's not an interesting thing, we do not only predict something for the, for the right-handed sector, but we also predict something for the, for the light neutrino sector. In particular, since also the, the charged lepton singlets and also the lepton doublets were charged under this uh, Le minus mu minus L tau symmetry, this means that we also predict a certain uh, pattern for a softly broken charged, uh, charged lepton mass. And um, this, of course, is going to translate in the end, if you do the calculation, this is going to translate into mixing angles. And in particular, we have shown that uh, for, this, for this symmetry, you very generically actually predict, I mean, if you, if you want to make it work, you predict a relatively large theta-1-3. And that was um, actually something that we did before the, the measurement of this angle. So it's really that you, that you gain something. Why? Because you predict not only the, the uh, right hand neutrino mass pattern, but you also predict mixing angles, which are very specific. And now if a future experiment, for example, measures um, like theta 2, 3 to be very much different from 45 degrees, okay, then this model is ruled out perfectly fine. We have learned something. And this is the point of this model building. So you really try to link um, the sterile neutrino sector to some um, visible sector, in that case the light neutrinos, and this sector you can test and by this you can in turn gain information about the dark sector that otherwise would be non-testable at all. And also we have shown that, um, which is another test, that under certain assumptions at least you can even uh, calculate the mixing, uh, the, sorry, the, the mass pattern for light neutrinos, and again if we measure anything like that we're ruled in, if we measure anything different we're ruled out and we know that this is definitely not the model to go. Okay, um, this setting in particular resembles one of those mass shifting schemes that I, that I uh, showed you before. And so when you look at the scheme, first of all you can, you can go into the symmetry limit, which is just a black line, so ignore the red part for the time being. And um, then this is just what I, what I have shown you before explicitly in the calculation. So in principle, these two masses here are exactly degenerate, and we could set them, for example, to GEV or which is the mass scale in the MSM, we could also set them to a higher mass. Um, and this lightest mass is exactly zero. So it's really predicted by the symmetry. Now if we break the symmetry, then what, what happens is that, we, that we're then in this red region. And this means that in particular the small zero mass eigenvalue is shifted to a higher scale and the degeneracy of those two guys is broken and they're apart by some small, um, by some small amount um, which resembles the quantum, or which is also of the order of this um, breaking terms. All right. Um, so this is um, definitely one bottom-up scheme because we take this one from the bottom and lift it up. And uh, this is what we can achieve by uh, one of those symmetries. So this is one example. And uh, there are some more examples in the literature. And right. one mechanism. Yeah, sorry? Was there a question? Can I ask you a question? What are Yes, uh, from uh, Sylvia and Garam. So, what mm, are the typical values? Hi. What are the typical values of the mixing angles you have now between the KV sterile neutrinos and the light neutrinos? Uh, in this particular model. Yes. Or, um, in this particular model, I don't know it by heart. I would really have to look that up. But in principle, you really you would always have to to tune your um, in principle your Dirac masses. So this one has to be really. Okay, I mean, I can kind of show you. Um, the point here is that as long as, as these um, 
uh, as, as these entries here are zero, there is no problem with this mixing. But of course, if you break the symmetry, there is no argument to have zeros here anymore. So you really have to be careful that uh, these guys are not populated by large entries because otherwise you will have a, um, a considerable active sterile mixing. But this is just one of the, I mean, you have to check that the bounds are fulfilled. That's, Thanks. that's the story. Okay. Any, any more questions to that particular setting? There is, ah, there, there is, I think, I see something from the CERN team. CERN team? <laughs> Hi, this is Steve from uh, CERN. Um, Alex, when you had the charge left on correction matrix, um, what was setting the value of, of lambda? Was that an arbitrary choice? I mean, it looks like the Wolfenstein parameter, but is it, was it just arbitrarily chosen? Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yeah, I think Alex went away for some reason. But. Alex? I'm sorry, it's who's not talking. Can you hear me? My, my, my computer just crashed. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not that I was afraid of the question or anything. Okay, so I have to jump to that. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I can hear you, Steve. So always when, when somebody asks a question, I can pretend my computer will fine. Okay, um, I'm going to see my slides. Can you see it? Yes. This is really, really difficult here. Um, okay. Um, yeah, let's let let's just try. I mean, at some point, I will be able to see my slides again, I guess. So I'm um, um, I'm asking about the uh, charge lepton. Steve, can you repeat the question? Yeah, if, if if you look on the slide where you have the charge lepton mass matrix or mm -hmm. the mm dagger, the charge lepton mass matrix, yeah, mm -hmm. um, you have this parameter lambda, mm -hmm. which is appearing there. Which is giving, and that lambda is giving you your prediction for the reactor angle. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking uh, why it looks like you've chosen that lambda to be the Wolfenstein uh, lambda, but I'm, ask, I'm asking uh, why is that a free choice? You just chose that to be the Wolfenstein uh, lambda. It is, it is a, uh, to some extent, it is a free choice, yes, because essentially this lambda, I mean, this form here arises um, when, you, when you do the soft breaking. So in principle, if you, if you break the symmetry anyway, of course, you can, you can choose not only your baking terms for the neutrinos, but also for the charged leptons. And um, this is the choice you have to make in order to um, get a resemblance to um, the mixing parameters that we measure. But it's not predicted in that sense. So it's not really a prediction. It's just it's, no, it's, it's, not, it's not a prediction in a stricter sense. It is a prediction in the sense that um, once you since you, since you want to have the soft breaking in any case, um, then, of course, you can, you can also uh, break the symmetry softly in the charged lepton sector. And um, then, in that sense, so to say, this, this breaking allows you for the choice. Otherwise, you would not be allowed to do. But it's not a strict prediction. OK. OK, that's it. Thanks. Yes, another say who you are. I'm Pedro, uh, on Machado. the director. Uh, so uh, can you go back one slide or maybe two slides? You have I, I, I can uh, I can more. try, but I have to check if I'm at the right one. Is that it? Yeah, this one. So you have these small s and these big s parameters. What? Do you have any link between them, or it's just free parameter also? Because um, one should be like b, right? While the other one should be something of order of uh, uh, sub electron volt, like 0.05, something like this, right? right. Right. So the point is, we, I mean, there is, uh, you have, a well, there is not really a link. What you have is that, um, so you, you, can, you can think of it as an explicit symmetry breaking. So if you do this, um, and, um, okay, how to, how to say, so if you, if you do an explicit symmetry breaking, <clears throat> you must be kind of close to the symmetry limit. Otherwise, you would not even talk about the symmetry. So it could be that the symmetry is just not, there for fundamental reasons, but for some reason we are in a situation that is close to the symmetry. 
So it's like this, like this isospin symmetry in nuclear physics, essentially. And so it wouldn't make sense, the whole consideration wouldn't make sense if, for example, these lowercase s parameters would be much, 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 much larger than this mLs, because then you would never at all talk about the symmetry limit. So in that sense, it, is, it makes only sense when you are, uh, to some extent, in the symmetry limit. But that's, um, I mean, always, like, when you talk about symmetries, you have to do it like this. The thing is the, 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 the relative size, right? Mm -hmm. Because if the big S has a uh, uh, value of the small S, then mm -hmm. you don't have a V that matter. Sorry, if, if the big S has? If the big S is equal to small S, let's say, or of the same order, mm -hmm. then you, you would never have K V dark matter. Right. So my, my question is about this tuning. If you, you, you need to choose this tuning or if there is some you, that you, cannot, you, you, cannot, you cannot really predict absolute scale. So you have an argument that the small, A's, the small s is very small. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in the symmetry limit. But you have no argument that the big S is small but not as small. Okay. So in that sense, I mean, when, whenever you use symmetries and you are in that limit, I mean, you, you have these naturalness considerations and... Um, you can't, I mean, uh, all the, all, from this you, you cannot free yourself, I'm okay. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. So, uh, let's... Alex, we can, can continue. Uh, we have 20 minutes uh, before the, uh, mm -hmm. when we should finish. Mm -hmm. So, how long do you plan? Because we should not sacrifice discussion. I mean, these webinars are really an occasion for us to discuss together. Um, so how long do you plan? How much time would you need for your talk? So I would, um, if so, I, I do not have to discuss all four models. Um, I could uh, just discuss one more, and then go to the conclusions essentially. Because I mean, people can can look at the slides. People can contact me. I mean, it's it's uh, the references are in there. So if people are interested in other models which I could not talk about, um, I think there is a way to retrieve this information. I'm sure we have time for at least two examples. Has anybody have uh, kind of problems in continuing a little bit farther at 3 o'clock? If they have, can they write them in a message? Uh, uh, and in the meantime, we can continue. Mm -hmm. So don't, I don't think it's a problem. Oh, yes, they have. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, I mean, one, one, yeah, one, one, one will always be there who has problems. No, no worries. I mean, I, I present one more, and, um, and then I can, I can essentially jump to the conclusions. Okay, but then I will... Um, I will do it differently. I will not talk about the split CISO, but I will rather go to the Robert Nielsen models. And I have to see if I'm... Okay, I still cannot see my slides, so I'm, I have to see if I'm still orientated. Okay. I should we are 111. Roger Nielsen, exactly, exactly yeah. yeah. Okay. Example so is, number four. This is great. Uh, hopefully, at some point, my slides will come back. <laughs> Let's see. Um, all right. Yeah, so um, with these uh, Frogger Nielsen models, this is then uh, the second type of model that I would um, like to present. And um, so the Frogger Nielsen mechanism itself is um, something which is, which is very well known. Um, in particle physics, in particular, it was uh, introduced to... Um, uh, to explain the quark mass patterns. And um, people have spotted uh, relatively quickly that one could also use that to explain the mass patterns for K-Wish geometry, simply because Forgot Nielsen is very, very well suited to um, explain very strong hierarchies. And um, this has been done. And um, this, so here I, I say one of the features is suppression may be as strong as for split C, so no, I couldn't talk about the split C, so that's a bit unfortunate. Um, in principle, what it means is that we can really have exponential suppressions of mixing, uh, of, of uh, mass eigenvalues. So it's really, um, it's really a very strong suppression mechanism. Um, okay, so let me see where I am. Here we go. Um, okay, so uh, what the froggart nielsen mechanism is, in general, is that um, one typically assumes a global U1 symmetry. Um, it, you could, in principle, gauge it, but uh, it's, it's often assumed to be global. Um, you could, in principle, also do a discretized version, but this is the U1 is the, is the, um, the version that was historically um, um, proposed first. And um, then the point is that 
what you need to do is you need uh, generation dependent charges under this U1 symmetry. And um, what is then going to happen is that you will have um, essentially when you when you uh, further assume certain certain uh, high energy sector and that is actually one of the weak points of the Fermi so that is usually not mentioned so you really need a high energy fermionic sector that is not really specified and that's in most of the cases not really talked about actually um, but once you assume all that what is going to happen is um, that you will have CISO type diagrams no that's fine so on the right slide um, I'm sorry I still can't see my slides at all and um, so the point is what you do is you um, assume not only a fermionic sector but you also assume certain scalars and um, these scalars um, will develop vacuum expectation value this is also just an assumption and so these scalars are usually called flagons and okay, 120 and um, the point is really that like when these fermions which I call S in this particular diagram um, when they're heavy enough what we can do is that we can essentially integrate them out and then we have diagrams like in a normal uh, CISO type 1 setting and um, this means that we have then uh, suppressions of the um, of the masses okay so how does it look um, we will you know, in 122 all right so um, we have we uh, we will by this Froggen Nielsen mechanism we will get um, Yukawa couplings which have this structure so you have a natural size of the Yukawa coupling and then you have this lambda which is a suppression parameter and you have these generation dependent U1 charges A, I and B, J uh, where I and J label the generations and the point is that like these natural um, Yukawa couplings they can be relatively large or let's say order one or a bit below or something and um, still you have this, this lambda involved and this lambda is um, a ratio between the Flavon waves and some high scale that is again not really talked about in the Frogat Nielsen. So it's it's really it, it contains a lot of assumptions, but this is the price that you have to pay in order to use it, and it's uh, after all it's a very strong suppression mechanism. Now um, this scale here, um, these scales are not specified, but one can argue that um, they are such that this lambda is uh, kind of small, and then what is going to happen is that since these uh, A's and B's, these charges are generation dependent. Is that the suppression is uh, going to be by some by some uh, charge in the exponent, and this charge is going to be uh, different for the different generations. So this actually means that we can really uh, get a pattern, a mass pattern that is um, that really explains some hierarchy between the first and third generation. Um, all right, and then this means that the this coupling that we that uh, is Y I J. This is actually not in the in the fundamental Lagrangian, but it's really just an effective coupling that we get for light um, for, for for low energies, and this we can then use in order to explain certain patterns. And okay, I still have to swap between my uh, between accurate and the and the presentation. Um, yeah, so of course, um, once again, there are definitely several problems involved with with Froggen Nielsen that are usually swept under car under the carpet, but um, this is generic for all Froggen Nielsen type models. So, all right. What you have to do is um, you have to um, you have to choose certain charges which are generation dependent. And um, what we need in our case is we need to to choose these charges G of the right-handed neutrinos in such a way that we generate a strong hierarchy for the right-handed neutrinos. This is, so to say, the most important thing in order to obtain a KV sterile neutrino. Of course, we don't get rid of choosing all the other charges appropriately. So you really have to, to in principle, assume a lot. And this, of course, is uh, why people always consider the Froggen Nielsen to be not very predictive by itself, but rather it's typically used in combination with a flavor symmetry. Um, still, actually, even if you use the Froggen Nielsen alone, um, and when you look at it in detail, it's still like this, that you can actually be quite predictive. And how you do that is you write down this general Lagrangian. And um, so we have actually shown that um, you can then under certain, I mean, with, um, uh, by, by choosing an appropriate setting of scalar fields, what you can do is that you parameterize um, the mass matrices in terms of uh, two real parameters. And these real parameters are the uh, R0 and the alpha 0. And then, of course, there is this lambda, which is the, um, the suppression parameter. And then we have, uh, in our paper at least, we have discussed two different scenarios which are the scenario A and B. 
and you can see <clears throat> on the bottom of the page you can uh, you can see the eigenvalues and indeed also with a frog and nielsen what can happen is that first of all you have you can have an explanation why one of the right neutrinos is extremely small uh, it has an extremely small mass and this is enforced by this six power of the suppression parameter lambda um, still you can you can um, choose your charges in such a way that the other two are are uh, quasi-degenerate but not exactly degenerate. So again, we here uh, resemble a, a, a pattern that looks very, very much like the new MSM setting. Um, however, you can also go beyond that. So you can also um, go into a setting where you have just a hierarchy among all the three masses. And that, of course, is also some structure. It does not strictly resemble the new MSM setting, but this does not mean that it would not work. This just means that um, it may be a different scenario which is also possible. And um, again, this is a suppression mechanism. So uh, essentially, what you what you do with this mechanism is that you you um, suppress certain masses in a generation dependent way. And um, so this again assumes uh, sorry resembles one of the one of the mass shifting schemes that I had before. In that case, the so-called top 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 down scheme. Um, another bonus of the Robert Nielsen type models is that you can actually show that seesaw is always guaranteed to work. So why is that? This is relatively easy. Um, in principle, you can you can just compute the light neutrino mass matrix, and you will see that the, that all the um, all these G charges, which are the ones that are responsible for the suppression of the right neutrinos, they just drop out. And why do they drop out? Simply because you have a Majorana mass term involved, and this Majorana mass term is, for example, breaking lepton number, but even more, it's breaking any global U1. In particular, it's going to break the um, U1 Robert Nielsen symmetry. So it's actually relatively clear from a principal point of view that um, that these charges G1, G2, G3 are going to drop out of the light neutrino mass matrix, and you're not going to have a problem with that. Um, so CISO is guaranteed to work, um, and still there are some um, there are some some uh, some other features that one has to one has to look at, and um, when you when you really do the analysis in detail, it's actually quite interesting to see that uh, this, the Frogger Nielsen is not as arbitrary as it looks. And in particular, for example, it, it disagrees with certain settings um, that are uh, used for uh, production mechanisms of sterile neutrinos. So for example, if you want to have a KV neutrino mass pattern that is suitable for this production mechanism that relies on left-right symmetry, you will see it's not going to work with the Frogger Nielsen. So even though the Frogger Nielsen really assumes a lot, it's predictive in the sense that it still disagrees with certain other things. And by this, you can sort of say narrow down the possibilities and not really get a real prediction, but something that is uh, at least a range of predictions, which is, which is at least in principle testable. So um, this also has some benefits, but again, you have to pay a price as usual in model building. OK. Now, I'm unfortunately, I will not be able to talk about this minimal extended seesaw. So I assume that, that the author of that paper is at the moment listening, so sorry for that. Um, and instead, I will very shortly mention something else. Let's see if I come to that slide. Yeah, so um, I would like to talk about the generalization. And um, in principle, there are uh, not only KEV sterile neutrinos that um, you, could, you could use for um, uh, as uh, KE fermionic dark matter, but of course there are other settings. There are, for example, gravitinos, there are modulinos, so there is, there is all kinds of stuff. And um, However, in principle, uh, to some extent, all these, all these settings differ just by the name. Of course, they might have a different origin, but in principle, um, you, can, you, you, could, you could be tempted to really write down um, a general description of those. And uh, this is what, what Steve and me did with this uh, KEV inert fermions, which we called uh, Kevin's. And so the point of that is, is uh, not so much that you, that you give the baby a name. It's rather that uh, if you go in such a setting, what you can do is that you can essentially just, um, for example, study the different production mechanisms in a very general setting. So indeed, we have done that. I've done it for one um, particular production mechanism, which is uh, thermal overproduction of the dark matter by a subsequent dilution of entropy, uh, by entropy production. And um, what you can see is, of course, first of all, this is to be expected. It works. Um, this is 
to, this is kind of clear because it already works for a more specific type of particle, namely the KV sterile neutrino. But the point is really that uh, by these model independent studies, you could um, you can also find some parameter regions which do not work for a KV sterile neutrino, but which may work for one of the other candidates. So you can really do model independent studies in a sense, and um, you can then, if you go, if you use that to apply it to, ver to a very specific model, of course you will have um, different um, boundary conditions or different bounds um, that may or may not rule out some of these scenarios. But nevertheless, it, may, it might be an interesting way um, to find some um, some uh, alternative uh, points in the parameter space that you might not have been aware of before. Um, okay, then uh, I think I should conclude in order to have some time for questions. Um, so first of all, my conclusion is that, uh, or something that I really want to mention is that this warm that matter business, even though it's still regarded to be kind of exotic by some people, is not necessarily worse than cold dark matter. It's just really a different thing. And my, my perspective as particle physicist is that, well, if something is uh, not forbidden, it's allowed. So uh, in that sense, it really does not do any harm to think about that. and. Uh, there is no problem with that, and if we at some point exclude it, well, fine. Then this is this was our job to exclude that and have gained some more information. Um, then the general framework that had been proposed um, a while ago is the so-called new MSM, the neutrino minimal standard model, which is a very nice framework um, because it already contains everything. You can do a lot of phenomenology with that. However, the problem is um, that you have to put in some assumptions. You don't really motivate these assumptions, so it's really a question: Can you kind of like motivate that from um, from uh, somehow more fundamental step, or can you can you give in some model some some mechanism, some reason for for such a specific pattern? That would of course be interesting. Um, then, uh, in principle, of course, this approach can can yield very very fundamental connections between neutrinos and dark matter. Um, at least we can we can learn if uh, these two uh, these two like different somehow differently looking things uh, could still come from uh, one at the same sector actually. And um, of course, the the, the long term goal um, must actually be not only to look at that from the particle physics side, not only from the cosmology side or the astrophysics side, but actually what you would really need is a combined effort. So you really need synergies. And um, in one, one particular way to have synergies is, of course, to have something like invisibles. And uh, yeah, that's it from my side. Um, thank you very much. And then I hope that there will be some time left for some more questions. And I'm going to give my best to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we can take questions. So if people want to raise their hands, we can see them uh, there. Uh, maybe in the meantime, uh, can I ask you something um, about, OK, there are lots of questions. Then maybe let's take the other questions first. So let's start with the CERN team. CERN team? Silence. <laughs> OK. So um, just a small question. If you go back to the program Nielsen possibility, at the KEV, you know, for these scenarios, um, even if you raise the scale, you still have to explain quite a few things. So do you have problems here with flavor changing neutral currents, I mean, mu to e gamma, mu to e conversion, etc. Why are you completely free? I'm not talking of the, you know, the, the flavor changing part without lepton number violating. Do you understand what I mean? Um, I think so, yeah. Uh, let me just try to go back to the slide. I'm still not seeing my slide, so... Um, I think it was slide number probably here, 150, could that be the right one? Uh, we are at the... Right. the yeah. Sorry? Okay. So um, the point is, of course, you... Um, you f first of all, you have the same problems like in any Froggen Nielsen setting. That's clear. Now, um, depending on where you come from, like uh, for example, if you come uh, from from a SUSY gut, you will have the SUSY flavor flavor problem. That's just not so easy to avoid. Um, okay, now MPIK says that they also cannot see the slides. I'm sorry for that. I don't know what's wrong with the presentation. Um, so the thing is, what 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 we have shown is so what you, for example, do typically in uh, in a SUSY setting is that you assume that uh, flavor violating terms are not at all present at a high scale and you just generate them by running down to lower scales. 
Now, what you can show in, in that particular setting, at least, if you, if you do it for KV sterile neutrinos, we have strong bounds on the couplings. And you can show that for, for those, for such strong bounds on the couplings, even if you run down to lower scales, it's not going to be a problem. So, in a sense, at least from the, from, to some extent, at least for, for the, for the sector, it's easier. He's not We lost him. So, so sorry, I did not hear. We lost him. Okay. I'm here. So you, yes, we hear you now. Okay, great. Hello. Yeah, hello. I, uh, I can hear you. So you, say, yeah. So making that assumption of let's say universality at the highest scale or whatever, even if you do the running, there is no problem. And still, you can accommodate the missing angles and the masses. Is this correct? Well, you can accommodate, yes, but it's accommodate is exactly the right word. I mean, Robert Nielsen is not extremely predictive, but right, you can, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Hi, Alex. Hi, Steve. Um, okay, no, no, he's gone again. <laughs> okay, um, Steve. It's always when Steve asks a question, isn't it? <laughs> an automatic block. Whenever I appear, um, so I, I still don't understand um, fully the, the answer to Bellin's question mm -hmm. because um, I mean the point about Newton and Gamma is that uh, here you, you you don't have the sort of norm for having Nielsen with a high scale uh, mass scale here your your the lambda your yes. your mass scale appearing in the private Nielsen is actually quite low. So that, mm -hmm. it, looks a bit, it looks a bit dangerous uh, to have such a low mass scale, low scale. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the thing is, so it, it it really it really depends on in in which in which setting you go. It really depends. And I mean, it's um, you have first of all you have quite a strong suppression by these exponentials, so it's not necessarily the case that really the, also the whole Frogger Nielsen scale is relatively low. Of course, if it is relatively low, you, you have to check these bounds. So, I mean, what, what we did in this paper was a general discussion of the settings that you could in principle have. And then, of course, if you, if you choose one particular set of couplings, if you choose one particular set of charges, then you will really have to show that um, this is the case. But that was not so much the point of the study that we did. The point was rather that we can that we said, okay, well, there is the setting. It looks actually not predictive at all. Um, still, you can kind of predict things, and you you can accommodate um, for the experimental bounds that exist. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Now we can take care of the question from Shaban. 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 <laughs> also offline. Shaban, can you can you hear us? Or can you see? the connection may be a little slow? Hello, hello. Hello. Okay, so okay, so I, I'm just uh, concerned about the relic abundance of the warm dark matter. Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned in the standard scenario, the relic abundance of uh, any warm dark matter will be two order of tubes higher, and the typical solution usually people use is kind of late entropy dilutions. And in fact, mm -hmm. I'm I'm not very convinced with this scenario because you know the freeze out temperature in case of warm dark matter is quite low even below the nucleothesis uh, temperature. So it's very dangerous to adopt any late uh, entropy or uh, any other mechanism at this late temperature. Another thing, usually we try to solve it by using non-thermal uh, scenarios. And you know this is model dependent and depend on the reheating temperature, how high, how low, respect to also the free out temperature. So I wonder which type of scenario you are considered and if there is any kind of standard now uh, way of solving this problem. Okay. Um, so uh, first of all, I would say you're completely right. It's not so it's not so easy that you just write on a model and you also you need to justify how to how to produce the dark matter. Now. Um, at the moment, as, uh, as far as I'm aware of, there are like uh, different production mechanisms around. 
there is, to my knowledge, no study which would really try to match uh, detailed numerical calculation of a production mechanism with actual models which also contain um, uh, some, to some extent, some mechanism or some explanation for a KV scale. So this is exactly what I'm saying. In principle, one should really, uh, one should really, and this is what I'm, what I'm also arguing for. One should really try to um, start collaborating between people being uh, really specialized in these Boltzmann equation treatments and between people uh, being specialized on the model side. At the moment, it's that you have some production mechanisms around which work more or less. You have some models around which work more or less, and I would say the next step should really be to like interconnect those two uh, as far as possible. And there is, to my knowledge, no real study around at the moment that would really already attempt that. But so in your paper with Steve, uh, I think you consider late uh, late entropy dilution. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In, in in that in that paper, yes. But there we did not. Um, but this is. is I mean, is, is it? No, it was no danger with uh, light elements and uh, nucleophenesis temperature because, as I said, you need to dilute really at very low temperature. So in, in that case, I mean, first of all, this, this paper did not contain any explanation for the KV scale, so it's more on the production side. Um, there, uh, it was no problem in the sense that we that we were re very careful with um, with this, so to say, reheating. It's not really a reheating, but with this reheating temperature, so to say, we have a decay that finishes before BBN, and that was, um, as you correctly see, the by far strongest bound. So we we really had. I mean, this bound was really pushing us. So um, it is definitely something. Um, one has to one has to 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 add that there was uh, one study. Um, around before for KEV stereoneutrinos in particular, and there I'm not really sure if they actually handled that bound perfectly correctly. Um, so definitely this is one of the weak points of this production mechanism, but I'm not arguing in favor of any of those production mechanisms. Okay, it's, thanks. And of course there could be others, and uh, hope, I mean hopefully people propose something more, that would of course be great. Okay, are there any other questions? We are overrunning very slightly, so if there is any other question, we can take them. It doesn't seem so. In that case, we thank uh, Alex uh, again. We can give you a, uh, an applause from here, from that, right? <laughs> so, thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot uh, to everybody for uh, taking part to this webinar. I guess this is the last one before Christmas, so uh, I wish you all a um, very Merry Christmas and uh, Happy New Year and uh, we hope uh, we'll resume uh, with the new year, I think, um, this activity. Um, Pilar, do you want to add something? Uh, no, simply that we resume uh, on the 15th of January. So Happy Christmas to everybody. Thank you. Okay. Merry Christmas and bye-bye. Okay, and bye. Alex, it was very nice.